From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello, Ropecast listeners, and welcome to a new episode. Today, again, in the studio with me is not Peter Tischer, who is on vacation, but today I have another Peter, a very old friend of mine. So welcome, Peter. Well, good morning. And uh, the reason that I have my friend here today is that he has, for several years now, taken groups of people to the UK to look at English gardens. So we're going to talk today about English gardens. What makes them English? How do they differ from gardens in other countries? And what might tourists want to see while they're over in the UK? Well, yeah. when, ta when talking about English gardens, one of the problems really is, are those English gardens or are they just gardens in Britain and Ireland? <laughs> right. I think if you go right back in history, uh, perhaps to the Romans, then this would be a kind of Western European culture, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be specifically English or British. And yet we owe the Romans quite a lot. The idea of having a, an enclosed space that has grass and perhaps some little box trees and a, a statue. The sad thing is that very little is left of those Roman gardens, if we call them thus. It is perhaps a wall, Hadrian's Wall in the north, which doesn't very much look like a garden, no. does it? But I think um, there's something of a tradition when the monasteries were built, they too had these cloisters, that is, um, there was a, a green area enclosed by buildings, and like in Roman times, they had maybe some grass and, a, and something in the middle, perhaps not a statue anymore, but a, a tree or a water basin, a yeah, fountain. Exactly, and the important thing to remember is that one of their functions was of those monks to look after people's welfare. So they made sure there were herb gardens yes. within their monasteries, and it was not just herbs that were meant to cure all kinds of diseases. They also had one section that was meant for lethal plants. <laughs> yes. I wonder what they were meant for. Well, this, of course, is not specifically English. So I think we need to move on to what is called the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII, the end of the Middle Ages. And once the monasteries were dissolved, uh, there were new men, as they were called, who took over these vast estates and were able to do with them whatever they wanted, including enclosing land for their own private use, which was a completely new notion. Well, and on top of that, I mean, enclosing private land served a very important purpose. It made sure that other people were not able to penetrate into this private area, which was basically used for hunting purposes. Yes. With the Tudors, that is the, the monarchs um, starting just before Henry VIII with Henry VII, we also see the first thing I think that might be specifically English, and that is the knot garden. As far as I know, these didn't exist in earlier times, although we can't be sure of that. And um, these knot gardens, these strangely shaped bushes, replaced the so-called raised gardens of the medieval age. So slowly we're getting something that is a little bit specific to the region. But even in the 17th century, I think outside influence was still very strong, wasn't it? It is, and it's above all, friend, well, Renaissance influence, yes. influence coming from Italy, and then via France, it finally ended up in England in those days. I think many people are familiar with um, the Palace of Versailles, just south of Paris, and so they probably are aware of the kind of uh, grand scale, but also the formality of the gardens. And this is something that was uh, imitated throughout Germany, and French influence also arrived in uh, in England, but for reasons that we are well informed about, uh, the relationship between England and uh, and France has not always been the best. And mm -hmm. above all, when Charles II, well, the, who became Charles II, spent his ten years in France, he arrived back in England with the worst impressions imaginable of the French and France at all. 
Yeah, so the I think um, the, if you think of French influence, there would be one focal point, probably the house or the palace in a central location, and then these grand vistas, these straight lines all radiating out from this central point. And of course, English historians looking at this say, well, this is, you know, it is the French way, a centralized state system, that one focal point politically as well, um, everything controlled from the center. And then there was this great reaction to that in England. We don't want that. We 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 want a more well today we'd say democratic system. And, well, we uh, had to wait until the 18th century yes, to yes. see something like that arrive. And um, the man who's really known as a writer, Alexander Pope, was also very influential in in gardens, wasn't he? He was. I think, unfortunately, the uh, the place that was so influential um, ha has disappeared. That is Twickenham. There is no house there anymore, but still we have some examples from the period all over England. The basic idea was, um, what should we say, back to nature. Exactly. And this is when William Kent arrived. William Kent, who did away with straight lines yes. and all that French formality, and he was able to convince quite a few people of all the advantages linked to opening up this formality. And, well, it was perhaps a coincidence that, well, the man who is referred to as Capability Brown, well, his real name is Lancelot, Lancelot Brown, a farmer's son, who took up the ideas developed by William Kent, yes. who was an architect and painter. And, uh, well, then a revolution really started. Yes. I think we could um, end our little talk today by mentioning the ha-ha. <laughs> Well, but ha ha is something. Well, when you turn to other languages like the German language, they have something like aha effect. And if you ask Germans, they are not able to tell you what really is meant by that. Well, they will be able to tell you something about it, but they are not able to establish the link to the ha ha. And uh, this is one of the basic convictions of Capability Brown that, well, the garden created by man has to look like what, well, the creation of God was able to do. So the link between the, the man-made garden and nature as it exists without being touched by human beings was not to be visible. And this implied that he did away with walls, he did away with flowers, and when you arrived at the end of the garden, well, there was something that uh, marked the end of the garden, but it was certainly not a hedge, it was certainly not a wall. Although it looks like a wall when you approach from outside, doesn't it? That's absolutely true. And what they tell you is that it is meant to keep sheep and cattle away, which is perhaps true, but it was not originally his intention. No. Well, we've only reached the 18th century and there would be a whole lot more to say, but I think we'd better save that for another day. Thank okay. you very much, Peter. No problem. <laughs> Bye, listeners. You've been listening to Ropecast. Brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. Mm -hmm.